page 2. Second problem motivation, which consists of three parts. We have three fields. Visualize all goals and goals after particularly for the Shakyamuni. His holiness the Dalai Lama. Arab Avram Tishpara, Arab Nijishri, Arab Ajapani, Arab Tara, Arab Nigarjuna, Arab Sangha, Arab Deev, Vajra Chandra Pitti, the author of the text which we are studying, likewise Bodhisattva Shantideva, and so forth. And how you visualize them? You are there like your mothers, and you are uh, the child coming home, very demoralized, sad, lonely, and your mother is there, eagerly waiting to embrace you with love, affection, to give full attention and care. See if you can do this every day. Every time you begin your practice, see if this is, can be, if this can be done. If you do that, is it? Just it takes a little extra few seconds, and then the the quality of your practice, the progress, is going to be exponentially great. What is the field? Your two grandparents, all your family members, including your children and all the dear ascension beings. Here you are the mother and all of them are like your children and they come home very sad and you are there to give love, affection, full attention and embrace to the extent that each one of them feels themselves as so special in your eyes. And the purpose of this practice is to unravel this incredibly precious Buddha nature, the treasure of happiness within you. By cleansing the metal defilements which obscure this mind, which obscure this Buddha nature. And this defilement which obscure the, the defilements which obscure this Buddha nature is consisted of two parts of afflictive obscurations and cognitive obscurations. Afflictive obscurations which obscure you from achieving nirvana and cognitive obscurations which obscure you from achieving Buddhahood. These afflictive obscurations, which are three kinds of afflictions, all the disturbing emotions such as attachment, anger, jealousy, and so forth. They are the contaminated karmas, like the done non virtuous actions, and the active seeds of the above two. And the afflictive cognitive obscurations in the form of the subtle stains of the afflictive obscurations and these subtle stains manifest in the form of self centered attitude. So how to unravel this hidden treasure of the Buddha nature is through resorting to the resorting to the remedies to overcome the mental defilements. And the final remedy to overcome the afflictive obscurations which all go into the self grasping ignorance the final remedy is the wisdom of emptiness. And the final remedy to overcome the self centered attitude is bodhicitta which cherishes others more than oneself. So, with this motivation to finally to trigger these two remedial powers, bodhicitta and wisdom of emptiness, to cleanse the mind of all the mental departments so that the hidden treasure of enlightenment, the hidden treasure of the ultimate happiness is going to be revealed fully. For that matter, imagine that you are leading this group and all such beings are joining you. Let's turn to page 2. And these were greater compassion. You taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you the Buddha the Dharma at your homage. And here is that great compassion. You taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you the Buddha the Dharma at your homage. And here is that great compassion. You taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you the Buddha the Dharma at your homage. In dependent origination, there is no ceasing, no arising, no annihilation, no permanence, no coming, no going, no separation, no sameness. 
I put a straight to the continent with a supreme of all teachers, and the one who taught his peace, which is freedom of liberation. I prostrate to the mother of the Buddhas, the of the hearers and Bodhisattvas, who to the knowledge of all these hearers seeking classification to complete peace, who to the knowledge of all sources who have been migrated to achieve the end to the world, and to the possession of all nations to subdue itself for the varieties and in all aspects. The one who has transformed into the divine of God into motivated by our truth and the benefits of human beings, the teacher, Siddhartha, and protector to you and your frustrations. The one who has eliminated the level of conceptualizations and has endowed the divine bodies of the lost and the profound, will turn the chance of whatever noble light ways to do the Buddha without loss and your frustrations. Would you please say that? I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sahara. By my accumulation of the practice of healing and so forth, may I become the Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. By my accumulation of the practice of healing and so forth, may I become the Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. By my accumulation of the practice of healing and so forth, May I become a Buddha to thank you to all sentient beings. Sanya Chola Soshi Chola Ma Chancho Badu Pane Yasuchi Pane Chim Soki Rasonangi Dola Penche Sangi Dola Sho Sanya Chola Soki Chola Ma Chancho Badu Pane Yasuchi Pane Chim Soki Rasonangi Dola Penche Sangi Dola Sho Sanye Chola Sobe Chomanda, Chanjo Patu Pani Kapsushi, Dari Jin Sobe Brasomanke, Dola Penje Sanye Chuba Sho. All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tahara. The situation of causes is well as drawn by the great seer. Whether you experience a pain or not, whether you experience pain or not, that is determined by your in internal causes. The phenomena arise from the causes, causes in the form of self grasping ignorance and self centered attitude. Say, immediate cause in the form of the contaminated actions, negative karmas, contaminated karmas, and then which in turn are rooted to the, say, afflictions, such as attachment, anger, jealousy, craving and so forth, and which in turn are rooted to the self-grasping ignorance. And the self-grasping ignorance, nobody can impose on you. It is your own mind which creates the self-grasping ignorance. So finally, say, whether you encounter with external factors or not, that is a different story. 
But whether you experience unhappiness or not, that's within you. That's in your hand. So as long as we have this self-grasping ignorance, the pain is inevitable. The pain is going to be there. So the pain, who's, who's to be blamed eventually? Is the internal factor of self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. So the more the self-centered we are, we see that the pain is more, particularly the mental pain. So therefore, Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetu mitation tathagato. What these causes are, causes of miseries are, um, is taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni. That is a self grasping ignorance and self centered attitude within myself. No one can dictate on you, no one can impose these two causes in you. It is ourselves which give rise to, which give rise to these two things. So, knowing that, okay, finally these two are to be blamed. So whenever I have some suffering, so whenever some pain is there, uneasiness there, misgivings happen to you, misfortunes happen to you, immediately the finger must be directed towards the self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude in yourself. If that happens, any time something bad happens to you, then instantly the, the blame goes towards the self-centered attitude, self-grasping ignorance. If that happens very spontaneously, it is the mark of the success of your practice of the Dharma. Whereas, when these misfortunes happen to you, and then immediately your finger goes towards our side, right? we still need to work further, work more. Finally, problems can be created by others. Problems can be created by the traffic. Problems can be created by the weather. But whether you feel the pain or not, that is in the hand, in your own hand. Self-grasping ignorance, self-centered attitude, as long as these two are there within you, Inevitably, we have to experience the pain. So this pain, conditions are created by externally, but the fun cause is a, the within yourself. So therefore, whenever there's a pain, right, and don't expect this to happen overnight. It'll take time. It'll take time. When you are doing so much for dharma, so much for say dharma, so much in your practice so forth, and still it doesn't happen, the blame goes to outside, right? Blame goes to outside, oh, Gishiva says that, oh, which means I'm not doing good practice. No, still you may be doing good practice. But what I'm saying is that we need further progress. We need to intensify practice. We need to be consistent with practice. If that happens, slowly, slowly it'll happen. It may take some years. It may take some years. The moment it happens like this, the moment the blame goes towards you, not you, your own self-grasping ignorance, self-centered attitude. Again, make the distinction. Your self-grasping ignorance, self-centered attitude, and you make the distinction. You are the person who is not bad. You are the person who is going to become enlightened. You are the person who is going to become Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Don't kill yourself. You are so precious. You are so precious. Whereas, who is bad is these two demons inside. Self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. These two are bad things. Oh, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so hopeless, I'm so bad. No. This is your failure to distinguish between who you are and what these two demons are. You mix up the two. Don't mix up the two. You are someone who's going to become enlightened to benefit all sentient beings. You this person is so precious, is so precious. Don't look down upon this self. Don't look down upon this I. This I, this self is so precious. So who is to be blamed for all these miseries? Is the two demons inside. So the moment something bad happens to you, so much pain, and then the blame immediately goes to, turns towards the self-grasping and self-centered attitude. If that happens, your pain diminishes. The moment your, your pain goes towards the outside, your pain increases. And what do you want? Your pain to increase or diminish? <laughs> diminish, right? If finally, if you want the pain to diminish, we have to learn how to finally see that self grasping ignorance, self centered attitude. These two are responsible for all my pains, right? It doesn't mean that if you don't have these two, then the external factors, external factors, you will not meet external factors. You go, for example, even the Buddha met with many unfortunate external factors. But he did not have the pain. 
because the sun cross me ignorance and so Santa Daju needs to exterminate it. Okay, so with this aspect of Santa Mantra, Om Yedarma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Deshan Tathagato. When we recite this, then just to be reminded finally what this very compassionate Buddha so skillfully, so compassionately taught us is that all my problems, the pain which I'm going through, is all because of these two demons. These two demons, as the final cause, as the final causes of my miseries, is taught by the Tathagata. Okay, now how to bring an end to this, these two demons? It's also taught by this Tathagata. It's also taught by this great seer, Shramana, Mahashramana, Mahashramana, the great seer, the great saint, the Bodhisattva, he taught. So, in what way? How to bring an end to this? What, what did he teach to bring an end to these two demons? He, he, introduced, he introduced the two the two ultimate gurus, the two ultimate teachers, the two ultimate guides. Who are they? Bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. Bodhicitta to exterminate the self-centered attitude and the wisdom of emptiness to exterminate the wisdom. Please, self grasp me. So he introduced, he introduced these two incredible, incredible ultimate teachers, incredible ultimate guides to guide me towards Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasamkade, Bodhiswa. Okay, so this is what we need to keep in mind. And particularly in the context of the, the line 3 and line 4, when you say, Desham Jayu Nirota Evam Vati Mahasharmane. So, Desham Jayu Nirota, the cessation, Nirota, cessation, the freedom. The cessation of these causes, the two demons, is also taught by the great seer, the cessation. So when, it's, when you say this cessation, nirodha, then you think about emptiness. Whatever little experience of emptiness that you might have, you try to bring it there. Just bring this experience of emptiness here. And then you see that this mantra is so powerful, so powerful, so powerful. Okay. <coughs> Um, now let's turn to Heart Sutra Mantra, page 17. Let's recite this Heart Sutra Mantra. And this is the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha. And imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni, a very compassionate Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, I would very much encourage you to watch the 53 or 54 Buddha episodes. There's a whole series of the, the Buddha's biography uh, made in uh, the form of a documentary, a TV serial. So that, there are 43 of them, and um, TBC, you have it? Okay, TBC has it. <laughs> um, um, that's good, that's good. So the, perhaps the best thing would be um, for TBC to send an email to Mr. Temba Sri. You know Mr. Temba Sri well. And then he has a very good contact with the, the producer of the thing. Right? So Tibet House Delhi, we got permission. We got permission to screen that. Not for commercial. And so we are entitled. That. And likewise, TBC can also seek permission from. Yeah. So that is something we have to watch, where you can see that the we this will tell us who is our ultimate teacher. Otherwise, say, oh, Angelo, then Lama Sundapa statue is the main, and Buddha second we forgot. <laughs> oh, I'm Nima. Then Guru Rinpoche's statue is in the middle, and the Buddha Shakyamuni gone. And then, oh, I am what? I'm Chinese Buddhism, Xuanzang, or these gurus are there, and the Buddha Shakyamuni gone. Then Theravada is much better. Theravada, the Buddha is still there. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. That's so good. Then in some cases, oh, this is a Dharma protector. You are afraid of Dharma protector, not afraid of Buddha. <laughs> so therefore, Dharma protector is the main, and Buddha is on the side. So these are all the indication that we don't know who this the great teacher is. We don't know that. 
Okay, so with this, um, I would encourage you to watch that, watch that uh, the TV serial. So TV serial hopefully will make it happen as soon as possible. And uh, so there you will see that how this Buddha Shakyamuni um, traversed this journey, this journey from a very young prince to the final Tathagata, to the final state of the Buddhahood. So how did he go through all this process? So through this process, then having experienced all these things, then he was guiding us, he exalted us. So this is what we should be visualizing, that this incredible compassion Buddha Shakyamuni, just visualize him and so affectionately, so lovingly informing you, exalting us, guiding us, so affectionately guiding us that don't remain in the face of samsara, don't remain in the tears of samsara, come out, I'm there to help you, I'm there to guide you, I'll take you towards the light and come, come. The moment you hear this melodious voice of the Buddha Shakyamuni, you inspire your two kind parents, your children, all your family members, and all the other sentient beings. Look, this is what our, what our very compassionate teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, is guiding us. Let us not stay in samsara anymore. Let us go away from samsara towards the ultimate state of happiness, where the ultimate resource of the treasure of Buddhahood. Buddha nature within us is going to be activated fully and then we experience that we that the miseries is going to be unheard of. So let's go along Gate Gate Paragate Parasampani Bodhisattva. Okay. So with this we will recite. Imagine that you are leading and all the Buddha Shakyamuni and all the Buddhism Bodhisattvas, they are just watching us with this in us and then you are inspiring all the other sentient beings to come along with you in this part of the Gate Gate. <coughs> okay. Yeah, <clears throat> Same book, page three. 
Okay. Um, the first stanza, the first, not the least stanza, the first two lines, the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism in the benefits and beings, the teacher, scribe, and protector, to have any frustrations. Okay. Um, I remember His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in most of the teachings that, the public teachings that he do, that, that he do, uh, that he does, uh, I remember uh, His Holiness citing these two lines so often, so often, on the basis of which to, um, to reflect the kindness of the Buddhist Shakyamuni, on the basis of which to, to emulate the Buddhist Shakyamuni's, the, the uh, footsteps, the journey, and how the Buddhist Shakyamuni traversed along this path, and finally became the enlightened being. Okay, so uh, what it says here is that one who has transformed into the reliable guide. So this is from what we've learned, from what we've learned about the, the thesis, syllogism. Syllogism, it should have what? It should have the topic, predicate, and the reasons, and the example. So here, the the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, the one, the, the one who has transformed, the one, Referring to the young prince Da, the young prince Da as the object, as the topic. So this young prince Da as a as topic, and he eventually transformed into the reliable guide, reliable guide to lead all sentient beings towards the ultimate happiness. So the one who is who is that one? The young prince Da, object, topic, and a predicate. What's a predicate? Who has transformed? into the reliable guide, right? The most reliable guide. Number two is a predicate. And why, why this young prince became such a reliable guide? Because, because he was motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, number one. Number two, the teacher. Number three, the sugata. Number four, the protector. Because he went through these four, these four stages. He went through these four phases that he now became such a reliable, transformed into such a reliable guide. Right? Okay, so the topic is the young prince Siddharth. Young prince Siddharth. Young prince Siddharth. Or say, the, let's say, oh, the very famous Tathagata. Right? So you don't know who this Tathagata is. People were respecting. As the Tathagata, 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 right? Oh, he's so popular, he's so famous. He's so famous. So, for example, many people who do, they do not have a clue of who His Holiness the Dalai Lama is. Many people, they do not have a clue. But they know that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is so popular, so famous, right? And then if you ask them, who exactly is this person? They, have, they might not have, not have a clue. But then, if you say the name, they will say they will simply lit up. They will simply glow. That oh, he's so famous. He's an amazing companion, an amazingly famous person, right? So likewise, the Thakada in those days, the Thakada, the Buddha Shakyamuni, was revered as the with the epithet the Thakada. The Thakada meaning the one who has gone to the dustness ultimate. So at one point, at one point, what happened was that. Um, they were, they were a very young couple, a boy and a girl, a couple, a young couple. And both of them, from their past lives, from their past lives, uh, they, had, uh, they had a tremendous common connection with the Dharma practice. Then although they were, they somehow conditioned, they were conditioned by the environment, by the societal pressure to get married, uh, but Two of them were constantly in the mind towards Dharma spiritual practice. So, when the when the parents passed away, then the two of them decided to to leave on their own to take their own journey of spirituality. And two of them um, separate and started to look for their own teachers. Then after a while, maybe after a year or so, then again they met. They met and they started to share the experience of the teachers. And the boy was just so luminous and so happy 
And the girl was so unhappy. Was so unhappy. And the voice said, what happened to you? And she said, no, I did. So I will never go into the spiritual path. And the boy said, why? Were you, did, you get, did you meet with the teacher? And the, the, the girl said, yes. But I will never go back to spirituality. She was so demoralized, loss of spirit. And the boy was so happy. And he, then the boy was listening to the, the stories from the girl. And the girl had terrible nightmares to share with the boy. Terrible nightmare stories of how she was treated there in the and the girl said, I will never go to any spiritual teacher. And the boy said, No, just come to my teacher. She said, No, I will not go. Because she had a terrible experience. And then the boy said, No, it doesn't matter. You don't have to follow my teacher. The boy met the Buddha Shakyamuni. You don't have to follow my teacher. Just come. Come, see him, and then leave. Once you see him, <laughs> so just come and see him that's it and you leave then she said that's okay that's good to you. <laughs> then she came seeing the Buddha Shakyamuni just the glowing with radiance of compassion glowing with radiance of purity glowing with radiance of the wisdom she was just pulled by the Buddha Shakyamuni and instantly she became a nun and then um, say okay so, um, what I'm saying, what I'm going to say here is that this girl, before meeting the Buddha Shakyamuni, the boy was telling the girl that my teacher is known as the Tathagata, right? And she heard about the Tathagata, that I'm very popular, but still I have no trust. Very popular. So, now the question is, so this Tathagata, this Tathagata, who's so popular, right, the one who is transformed into the reliable guy, he is such a reliable guy. He is transformed into a reliable guy from a very young prince. How did you transform into such a reliable guy? How can I know that? Only if I know that, then I will, then I will follow him. Otherwise, I'm not. Right? Okay. Then, because he tra he transformed into such a reliable guy because of these four factors. The first one, motivated by altruism to benefit all sentient beings. Number two, the teacher. Number three, the sugata. Number four, the protector. So these four reasons. Right? And the four reasons, how I apply the four reasons to, to see that this young prince became such a reliable guide. So these four reasons can be, can be applied in two ways. One, one in the, the four reasons in the proper sequence. Altruism, teacher, Sugada and protector. And the other in the reverse order. Sugada, no, the protector, Sugada, teacher, altruism. You're getting it? The four reasons are there. What are the four reasons in the proper sequence? Altruism, teacher, Sugada, protector. This is the, the proper sequence. If through the proper sequence, understanding understanding this young prince having gone through these the sequence, through this proper sequence of the four factors. He became the reliable guide. Right? One. Number two, so this, okay, number two, this very famous person known as the Tathagata, right? Tathagata. I don't know his school, I don't know his background, whether he was a prince, then left the palace, I have no clue, but he's so popular. So this person, who is so popular, revered as the Tathagata, revered as Buddha, how he, how, how come that he's such, such a reliable guy? Because, because of the four factors. Because he's a protector, reverse order. He's the protector, Sugada, then teacher, then altruism. Okay, so this is what we need to know. This is so important. These two lines. Don't think that I mean there's additional prayers. I have already many prayers to do. <laughs> Again, he's adding, when he's giving me more prayers. This is heavily loaded with meaning. Heavily loaded with meanings, these two lines. Okay, let's see. So, the proper sequence is in relation to, is in the same, the same, the same person as the Buddha can be, in, can be seen in two ways. One is a causal 
and the other the resultant. The coarser one is Prince Siddhartha. The resultant is Tathagata the Buddha. Right? He became the Buddha. What is the coarser? Coarser is the Prince Siddhartha, when he was a young prince before he became enlightened. So, if you look at Prince Siddhartha, and from there if you track, then it is the proper sequence. Initially, he was motivated by altruism. Then this made him to look for, to become a teacher. This made him to experience Sugata. This made him to protect the sentient beings. So therefore, he's the brother guide. One, whereas if you look at the resultant state, this Tathamada, who is so popular, right? From the, how come that he's such a lovely guide? Because you see that he's protecting the sentient beings. Right? How come that he's able to protect sentient beings? Because he has experienced the Sugata himself. How come that he is experiencing Sugata? Well, some of you may be wondering, what is Sugata? Wait, this I'll explain later. Yeah. Right? How come that he is actually, he is just experiencing Sugata? Because he has found the wisdom of emptiness which is labeled as the teacher. Right? How come that he has found this incredibly powerful path, the wisdom of emptiness? Because he was motivated, he was driven to look for this path by altruism. When? When he was a young prince, Siddhartha. Right? So this is the reverse sequence. Use, using the, the, the reverse sequence of the four factors, in order to establish this Tathagata, the, the, the teacher revealed as the Tathagata to be the relevant guide. Then number two is, the number two the, with the proper sequence, is looking at the young prince, Prince Siddharth, this young prince, how did he evolve, causally, causally, how did he evolve into the, to become such a lovely kind? Initially, he was motivated by altruism, oh, no doubt. So, I read his biography, I watched the, the, the movie, then I saw that he is motivated, he is motivated by great altruism to benefit all sentient beings. Then what did he do? Then he looked, this altruism worked to save the sentient beings. So for which, for, for which, then what did he do? He went in search of the, the solution to the problems of sentient beings. How did he go to search of the solution? By looking for a teacher. Teacher of what? Teacher of the final solution to the problem. What is that solution? The wisdom of emptiness. He was looking for that. Right? So initially he met the first teacher, Alamakara. The first teacher, Alamakara. He, he met with this teacher, and this teacher, he taught him what the teacher knew. And then the teacher, he happened to have a very experienced, very high level of the meditative concentration, but no wisdom of emptiness. And then this Young prince, young prince that he learned, he practiced. Just within a few days, he achieved the same level. Then he asked for more teachings. And the teacher said, now I, I, I don't have anything more to teach you. You and my spiritual reality is the same. Then Prince Siddha said, no, still this is not answer. Still this is not answer. So he went in search of another teacher. And then he found Udrika, the king, the, the teacher of Udrika, by the name Udrika. Then, again, Udrika, he reached Samadhi much higher than the first one. It's in fact, okay, I don't want to make it complicated. So there are the three levels, the three levels, the desirable form and formless, with the formless room, again, there are four, um, I don't want to go there. Okay, so the second teacher, again, he accepted Prince Siddhartha as a student. And then again, he gave the instructions. Within a few days, again, he experienced the same thing. And then again, he asked for more teachings. He said, no. What I have experienced, you have experienced. Now we are saying. And then Prince Siddharth said, no, this is not the, this. I still have not found the solution to the problems of the sentient beings. So he said, no, now you can't get anything. This is the final. And stay with me. And all my students are used to know so. Then Prince Siddhartha said, I have not, not come here to look for students. I have come here to look for the answer, for the, for the solution. Then he left. And then remaining in six years of austerity, practice of austerity and penance, then finally he experienced this, 
this experience of the wisdom of emptiness. Wisdom of emptiness, which is labeled as teacher, which is given the label the teacher. It is a provisional teacher, provisional, it is not the, the real teacher. The teacher is just a label given to this wisdom of emptiness. Why? The wisdom of emptiness is what he has to teach to the sentient beings to help the sentient beings. So therefore it, was, it is given a label, teacher. So he found this wisdom of emptiness. Having found this wisdom of emptiness, what should he do? Having found this medicine, first we, he has to experiment it, whether it works or not. Then he experimented it. He experimented with some emptiness. Then what happened? In the experience of the wisdom of emptiness, over these six years, what happened? Wisdom of emptiness, what is the opposite force? self grasping ethereal. So, as the wisdom of, wisdom of emptiness is more and more activated, intensified, then self grasping ignorance started to diminish, 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 diminish. As it diminishes, the root of all the misery stops. When the root stops, all the stems, all the, the stems, branches, and the flowers, the stem of the afflictions, the branches, the branches of the contaminated garments, and the flowers of the miseries, they all stop. Right? Then all the sorrows stop. All sorrows stop. All sorrows are transcended. What is the fourth seal? Trans in the Vanish peace, transcending sorrow is absolute peace. Transcending sorrow. He transcended the sorrow. The moment he transcended the sorrow, he peace has experience, ultimate peace has experience. This ultimate peace in the form of sugata, in the form of ultimate bliss. Uncontaminated bliss is experienced. So Sugada is the one who has gone to the bliss, the bliss of Nirvana, Sugata. The one who has gone to the bliss of Nirvana, the bliss of perfection, the bliss of beloved. So because of this experience, because of this experimentation of the wisdom of emptiness, then he experienced the Sugada, this perfect bliss, right? Perfect bliss, where the misery is nowhere to be seen. Misery is all gone far away. Misery is all gone far away. Total bliss, 24 second experiencing bliss. So with this experience, then he got confidence. Okay, now with this experience, this is what I like to give to all the sentient beings. This bliss, ultimate bliss, uncontaminated bliss, the bliss of the Sugata the bliss of the Tathagata, the bliss of the perfect purity. This is what I like to give to all the sentient beings. How to give? How to give? By performing miracles? No. By performing miracles, what happens at the most? Huh? By performing miracles, what will happen? If I levitate two feet here, TBC, if I levitate two feet here, you will all be amazed. More than me teaching on emptiness, you will be more amazed to see that I'm living in prison. Right? Then you will go out, then then in all the television in Singapore, Malaysia. Oh, in TBC, someone's living Millions of people, there is going to be traffic jam. 100% traffic jam. Millions of people will flock me. Right? And, in the, and all these millions of people, what they do, they will be, go back home. Wow. Only wow is left. <laughs> Nothing is left with the person. You don't have anything to take home. Only wow is to take home, that's it. It doesn't help. So in one way, the, this Tathagata can help the sentient beings. It's changing your mind. Changing your... Transforming the self grasping ignorance into the wisdom of emptiness. How to change it? Through giving teachings. So through giving teachings, then you protect the sentient beings. So, then you, because the experience of Sugada, then you protect the sentient beings to go, to go out. He went out to give, to, he went out to protect the sentient beings by giving teachings of the four noble truths, emptiness, both each other and so forth. So that makes him, makes him the protector. With these four things in proper sequence, with these four things experienced by one individual person, no doubt 
the person is the most reliable guy. Right? So this is the this is the the meaning of these two lines. And then, so these two lines were written by Acharya Dinaga in sixth century AD. These two lines were written by Acharya Dinaga in sixth century AD. So how did he do? He was thinking of writing, he was thinking of writing the Buddhist logic, a text on Buddhist logic. And then he wrote it on a slate. He wrote it on a slate. He began by the word of self-tradition. These two, these two words, these two words, and then the, the next two lines, totally four lines are there. And these two are the first two lines. He wrote four lines, and then he left four arms begging. Coming back, he saw that this slate, whatever he wrote, was erased. And again, the next day, he wrote the same thing. Again, he left. It happened three times. Everything's erased the moment he came back. Then the fourth time, he did not write this, but he wrote, Whosoever erased what I wrote earlier. <laughs> if you erase this out of joke, what I'm writing is not a joke. It's a very important time. Please don't erase this. If you erase this because you disagree with what I'm writing, come in person. <laughs> this is what he wrote, and then he left. Coming back, he saw a person waiting here. Right? Okay. Then, um, okay, then, so the remaining part next year. <laughs> okay. So, so, so this is how he started. This is how he wrote these two lines. And then, this was when? 6th century AD. The half the story, next slide, uh, the next visit. Then the, um, this, was, this was written in 6th century AD. Then 7th century AD, incredibly great, great Buddhist logician, Ashura Tharamgirti was born. And Ashura Tharamgirti, just visiting this text, which was written by Ashura Dignaga, these first two lines, he was he read these two, he was simply mesmerized and spellbound by the wonder of the two lines, just the two lines. Right? He could see all the intricacies, intricacies of these words, each of these words, transformed, reliable guide, motivated by altruism. Teacher, Sugata, protector. He was so mesmerized by each of these words. The link, he could see the link. He could see the explicit meanings. He could see the implicit meanings. He was so mesmerized by these two lines, which made him to compose whole chapter, whole chapter, about like 380 to 384, I think. 384 verses as a commentary on these two lines. And these two, three hundred, these 384 stanzas, they need another huge two books to explain that. <laughs> you read the 384 stanzas, you will not understand that. Right? So these two lines seem to be so simple, no, not at all. Heavily loaded with meanings. Right? Okay. So, with, from this, you tell me, what is that in which made this young prince sit down to, to experience the, the Sugata hood? Sugata hood, experience of the truth, bliss, freedom from all miseries. What made him experience that? Because of the cleansing of the self grasping ignorance. How the cleansing happened? Because of the wisdom of emptiness. What is the wisdom of emptiness? The wisdom which sees the ultimate reality. What is the ultimate reality, right? Is as, is as indicated by this Prince Siddhar, when he being Buddha, as the third seal of the four seals. What is the third seal? Everything is of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. This is the third seal. So, what we're doing now, what we're doing now here, I shall talk with, I shall chant with this text, this is to explain what this third seal is what this emptiness is, what is this ultimate reality is. Okay, um, yesterday if you could remember what we, page 10, 
Page 10 or page 11, maybe um, they may be different versions. Page 10 or 11. Uh, the stanza is stanza 34. In fact, these two lines, these two lines which I explain now, which I explain, okay, some of you may be feeling very sad that half the story. <laughs> Whether you're going to hear it next year or not, you're not too sure, right? What is that? He just left it there just with a such big suspense, right? Okay, the story has it that that then the, the two of them started debating. Who, who to? Ashok Dignaga and the person who was very dear, right? Two of them started to have debate. And then who can challenge this father of the Buddhist logic? Ashok Dignaga is the father of the Buddhist logic. How can you debate with him, <laughs> right? Everybody, anyone who debates with him is bound to be defeated. So the other person is defeated. Then in those days, in those days, it is, it is customary, it is customary that whosoever lost the debate should be converted to the tradition of the, the other person, to your opponent, to the tradition of the opponent. Not only you, along with all your students. <laughs> <laughs> right? If I if I share Chandra Kriti, you lost the debate, we all have to be converted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Fortunately, don't worry. Ashar Chandra Kriti is a great debater, don't worry. Yeah, he's a great logician, great debater, don't worry. In fact, he debated with Achara Chandra Gomi. You you know the story, I shared this video already. The text which we are studying. Very likely, very likely from my limited experience of the study of this, very likely this text is the outcome, this text is the outcome of seven years of debate between Achary Chandragirdi and Achary Chandragomi. Right? And Achary Chandragirdi, of course, he won the debate. I share this story already. It is, right? Okay. So, um, so the point is that two of them debated and then the other person lost the debate and the person did not stick to the, the, the tradition. So the person, instead of getting converted to Buddhism, the person having some mental power, supernatural power, he started to send fire from his mouth. He has this power to send fire from his mouth. He started to send fire from his mouth and the Ashadinaga, his robes were burned. Then Ajahn Dinaka felt so, so demoralized. <coughs> I am supposed to be following a bodhisattva path, meant to benefit all sentient beings. If I cannot even benefit someone who is right next to, my, next, to my, next to me, how can I possibly benefit all sentient beings? Then he became so demoralized, he became so, he felt so sad, and he threw this slate in the air, in the sky, with the, with the intention, that with the intention to give up bodhicitta spirit, the moment the state falls. And the state never fell. Right? And he looked up in the sky and Aramanjushi was holding the state. <laughs> Aramanjushi was holding the state. And then told him, My child, why are you demoralized? Why are you demoralized? I'm always there to guide you. I will, I'm always there to inspire you. Why should you feel demoralized? Continue writing what you're doing, continue writing this text, and this text will become eyes for the millions and trillions in the future. This will be eyes for the millions and trillions to see the light of the Buddhahood. You must continue this job. So this was the inspiration and the blessings given by Adam Jushri to Acharya So this is a story, don't worry. Okay, right? So now with that in mind, with that in mind, let's turn to page uh, stanza 34. Stanza 34, if you remember what we did yesterday, that the, uh, particularly, say, in, in explicating, in explicating or explaining, in explaining the sub nuances of, of emptiness, sub nuances of emptiness by the Prasangika, by the Prasangika, the person who was rejecting the, the views of a Swatantra Mathematica, right? Both of them are middle-way philosophers, middle-way school, but then 
but there is a slight, there is, there is a difference in terms of the, the final view between the two schools. And because which actually Chandogiti or the Prasangi Madhimik was trying to reject the position of the Sultana Madhimik girl, so that the Prasangi girl's certain norms of emptiness is flashed out. Right? Okay. So for that purpose, uh, actually Chandogiti uses three, uh, three, three very powerful reasons to reject that, to reject the Sultana Madhimik's view. The first one is, First one is, first one is rejection by by pointing to the absurdity, by to pointing to the absurdity that that Arya's meditative concentration should become the destroyer of all phenomena. Right. So yesterday I want to explain this and today to review it very quickly. On the one hand, imagine that the Arya beings they are seeing the emptiness of objective existence of all phenomena. So this is a review. I'm reviewing this for you yesterday, what we did yesterday. So on the one hand, we have the Arya beings, right, uh, whose meditative concentration is focused on the emptiness of objective existence of all phenomena. One. On the other hand, on the other hand, Sautantrik Madhimiga, they're saying that things exist objectively, right? Sautantrik Madhimiga saying that things exist objectively. In other words, Phenomena, objective phenomena, these two are the same. Things and objective things, these two mean the same, according to the Swatantra Madhimika, right? Now, now, if you combine the two, if you combine the two scenario, if you combine the two scenario, we see that, that according to Swatantra Madhimika, if there's no objectively existent phenomena, then there should be no phenomena. Because phenomena and objective existent phenomena, these two mean the same. Right? There should be no phenomena. Then, once a phenomenon is there, and if the phenomena suddenly disappear, then the phenomenon should be destroyed. Okay. Now, on the other hand, Arya's, Arya's meditative concentration, the superior beings, the beings who realize emptiness directly, they see the emptiness of objective existence of all phenomena. Right? Now, when you combine the two things together, then they see the emptiness of objective existence of all phenomena. So from the point of view of the Swartanu Madhimika, they should be seeing the emptiness of all phenomena. They should be seeing that all phenomena are non-existent. And since their mind is never invalid, their mind is always valid, there should be no phenomena at all then. Right? There should be no phenomena at all. Because there should be no objective existent phenomena. And from the point of view of the Swartanu Madhimika, objective phenomena and the phenomena, they should be the same. So when the objective phenomenon is not seen, phenomena should be, be not seen as well. If that is the case, then the phenomena exists at one point. And suddenly, because of the other being seeing the emptiness of all objectives in form of phenomena, all phenomena should disappear. So who destroyed all this phenomena? By the other being's meditative concentration. OK, so this is where, how, uh, how we should understand the first rejection. Stanza 34. If one's intrinsic characteristic arises through dependence, meaning intrinsic characteristic, say, intrinsic characteristic of the flower, intrinsic characteristic of a phenomena, for example, the flower, say the flower, if, it's, if one's intrinsic char characteristic of the flower arises through dependence on the causes, through dependence on the causes, right? If this I say, I say you are Prasangika and I am Swatantrik Madhimika. You are Prasangika and I am Swatantrik Madhimika. So what are you going to say? This flower, does it exist intrinsically or not? No. You just uh, Prasangika, what are you going to say? No. no. What will I say? Yes. yes. Okay. Now you are telling me that if this flower, if the intrinsic characteristic of this flower or if once or the flower's intrinsic characteristic, which I believe, which I believe, arises, it exists, the flower and the intrinsic characteristic of intrinsic flower, these two men say. So if just as this flower arises by dependence on the causes, from my point of view, intrinsic flower also comes to be by dependence on the causes. Right? From my point of view. 
from the point of view of the Sultan of Madinah. By negating it, by negating the intrinsic flower, by negating it, the entities will come to be, will become, will come to be destroyed. Will, if you negate the intrinsic flower, if you ask me, if the intrinsic flower is negated, then the flower is going to be negated, I will say what? Yes, because from my point of view, intrinsic flower, objective flower, and the flower mean the same. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. By negating this, by negating it, it's referring to the intrinsic characteristic or objective, object, objective existence. It, the entities, or the, the phenomena, or the flower will come to be destroyed, will come to become non-existent. Then if that's the case, emptiness or the experience of wisdom of emptiness will then become a cause for the destruction of all the phenomena of the, the entities or the phenomena. And yet, this cannot be true. Even if the other beings that are meditating on the emptiness in the Himalaya, many the emptiness, the Singapore traffic will continue. Even the other beings that are meditating on the emptiness of the Singapore traffic, but here in Singapore, traffic will continue, right? In Singapore, the sunrise, sunset, the traffic, all these things will continue, right? Okay, so this cannot be so. This cannot be so many that even if other beings, they see the emptiness of the objective existence or the intrinsic existence of all phenomena, it is happening, but the phenomena still exists. So therefore, the phenomena cannot be destroyed. Therefore, what has to be given up? What's the problem? The problem is because of my, the Swatandri Madhimikas believe that intrinsic existence and existence may the same. This belief is wrong. This has to be given up. Only if you give, if you, only if you give up this one, intrinsic phenomena and phenomena. Intrinsic phenomena doesn't exist and the phenomena does exist. If you're able to say that, then this problem will be resolved. As long as you stick to the belief that the intrinsic phenomena and the phenomena, intrinsic flower and the flower, these two men the same, you will never be free from this contradiction. This cannot be so. Therefore, a real entity, real entity meaning intrinsic entity, intrinsic objective entity, does not exist. Okay, one. Now the uh, the absurdity number two. What is the absurdity number two? By pointing to the absurdity, rejecting the rejecting the objective production by pointing to the absurdity of absurdity that conventional term should sustain the ultimate analysis. Okay. What is this? Okay, some people they without looking at the flower. <laughs> I know that you may form a whole flower. Okay, let's say. So group A and group B. Group A sees. Group A looks at it through the lens, through the ultimate analysis. Group B looks at it through the no. Group A looks at it through conventional analysis. Group B looks at it through ultimate analysis. Okay. Now, say when you look at it, when Group A looks at it, what do you see? Flower. When group B looks at it, what do you see? Emerald yes. flower. Okay. Now the stanza three. No, okay. Say. Um, what does it mean by emptiness of the flower? So, emptiness of the flower is the object as can be seen by the ultimate analysis, analyzing the flower, right? Analyzing the flower, whether the flower exists objectively, whether the flower does not exist objectively. So, this man which analyzes using the flower as the object and seeing whether it exists objectively or non-objectively, then you see the emptiness of the flower, yes, no? Okay, so with this, then you see that the moment the flower is subjected to the ultimate analysis, what happens to the flower? The flower disappears. What does it mean by that? Flower disappears. Which means the flower becomes non-existent? No. Then why, why, why did it disappear? Exactly, it disappears with respect to the with respect to the ultimate, on the ultimate domain, objectively. Ultimately, ultimately, the flower is not near. The, so this is what you are seeing. This is what you are discovering. You are getting it? Okay. So, which means that you look at it, group A looks at it, you see flower. Group B looks at it, 
the groupie does not see a flower. So the flower cannot withstand, cannot stand as a flower in the eyes of the ultimate analysis. Yes, no? Yes. Likewise, if I subject this pen, the group A will see as a pen, group will see the absolute yes. pen. Which means that this pen, just as seen by group A, cannot be seen as I'm a pen by the group B, who is who subjects the object to the ultimate analysis. So the conventional phenomena, they cannot, they cannot withstand the ultimate analysis. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Now with this, let's see. 35. When these entities of everyday experience, like the flower, the food, the traffic, you, me, house, and so forth, when these entities of everyday experience are analyzed, are analyzed, are subjected to ultimate analysis, subjected to analyze meaning ultimate analysis, so when subjected to ultimate analysis, over and outside the everyday reality. What is everyday reality? Conventional reality. How they are accepted conventionally. So when you analyze when I, when you analyze that over and above the everyday the everyday the world, everyday reality, which means over and above the conventional reality, conventional sense, what does it mean by over and above the conventional sense? Ultimate. When you cross the border of conventionality, you go into ultimate, ultimate domain. Right? Okay. So, um, when you cross the border of the conventionality, what do you find? What do you find? Huh? Emptiness. You find emptiness. So emptiness exists in the ultimate domain. Okay, so emptiness exists ultimately. Oh, no. Uh, no, right? So ultimately nothing is there. Okay. Even emptiness is also not there. Good. So emptiness is not found. <laughs> okay, so everything exists in this conventional domain. Everything exists in conventional domain doesn't mean that everything is conventional reality. It doesn't mean that. Don't mix up the two things. Conventional reality and existing conventionally, these two are different. Everything exists conventionally, but everything is not conventional reality. Right? Say, ultimate truth exists conventionally, but it does not, it does not exist as conventional truth. Ultimate truth, ultimate truth is not it is not conventional truth, but it exists conventionally. It exists conventionally, but it does not. It is not ultimate uh, uh, the conventional truth. And the ultimate truth is ultimate truth, but it does not exist ultimately. Right? This this distinction you should be able to make. Okay, let me say this again. We start with the ultimate truth or conventional truth. Conventional truth. Let's say conventional truth. Conventional truth, it exists conventionally, and it is conventional truth both. Right? And the ultimate truth, ultimate truth, it exists conventionally, but it is not conventional truth. Ultimate truth, what is ultimate truth? Emptiness. Emptiness or the ultimate truth, it exists conventionally, but it is not conventional truth. Now, on the other hand, ultimate truth is ultimate truth, but it does not exist ultimately. Ultimate truth is the ultimate truth, but it does not exist ultimately. It exists conventionally. Right? Okay, this we have to I just note it down for the timing. Note it down. Note it down. And then, should you have more questions, we will do it later on. Okay, good. Now let's see uh, 35. Okay, so say, so this flower, this flower exists in the co conventional domain or the ultimate domain? Huh? <coughs> conventional domain. So say this hall is a conventional domain? Yes. TBC hall is a conventional domain. The moment you cross this hall, what happens? You enter into awesome. ultimate domain. Then what happens to the flower? The moment you cross this, then the flower disappears, right? Okay, so which means everything, everything exists in this conventional domain. The moment you cross this border, everything will disappear, yes, no? Yes. Are you sure? What did, you, what did I say? 
that everything exists in the conventional domain. So say this room is the conventional domain. Everything exists in the conventional domain. The moment you cross the border of conventionality, then you enter into ultimate, ultimate domain. In the ultimate domain, nothing exists. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Krishna, is this a statement or we to believe or something that we have to like? No, the first, first note it down. Note it down. Don't have blind faith. Note it down. Note it down doesn't mean that this is my verdict. This is not my verdict. Note it down. Note it down is so precious. Later on, you use that as the basis of analysis. Right? See, so what you do is that if you are in, the, if you are in the treasure island, no matter what, whether stones or treasure, whatever, just bring, pull everything in your sack. <laughs> and don't believe that whatever you have put in the sack is, is gold. Don't believe that. Just put everything there because you don't have time there. <laughs> right? The moment, the moment from the treasure island, you come home. You come home, then you put everything down on the sea, which is treasure, which is stone, separate. Right? When you have little time, you, oh, this is stone, then your time just one hour gone, and then you have to get out. Right? You will not get anything. So whereas whatever you get to put in the sack. <laughs> right? And later on, you have a read, then you take it down and see what is stone, what is in gold. And if you're not sure, you can bring the, the goldsmith and yeah, give him some tea and see which is gold, which is stone. Right? So this is what you be doing. Okay. Don't believe. Simply note them down. And later on, you can subject this to analyze further as to what it means. This is so precious. These lines are so precious. These lines are so precious. Okay. With this, so what we've learned is that as long as we are in this, we are in this domain of the conventional, things exist in that domain. The moment you cross this border of the conventionality, what happens? Everything disappears. Right? Okay. So, uh, once it was, I think a year ago, there was one um, we conducted. What is that? We conducted I think Bodhicitta retreat, Bodhicitta retreat in Deer Park in India, in Himachal. <coughs> then we were talking about emptiness, Bodhicitta. Then we talk about this concept: how everything is conventional domain. In this room, the conventional domain. The moment you you know get out of the border of conventionality, then the nothing really exists. And then during the break time, one girl, Indian girl, he stopped me. Oh, Kishila. Usually she does not speak so easily. That day, I was so surprised. We know each other for so long. And she was Kishila, what you taught in the class is very true. What did I say? You said that everything exists in the conventional domain. The moment you cross the border of conventional, everything disappears. You are very right. I said, how? The moment we left the, the room, the room, everything what you taught disappears. <laughs> yeah. When we are with you in the club, in the, in the room, we get everything. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, she's not joking, it's true. Right? That's very true. <laughs> okay, so, uh, 35. When these entities of everyday experience, meaning the conventional truth, when they are analyzed, in the, when they're subject to analysis, ultimate analysis, over and outside the everyday reality, over and outside the everyday reality, meaning, the over and outside the conventional reality, conventional reality, they are found to have no other locus, then they will disappear. They are found to have no other locus, meaning they disappear, they don't exist, they cannot sustain the ultimate analysis. Therefore, do not critically analyze the conventional truth. What is conventional truth? Do not, do not analyze beyond the border of the conventionality. Conventional truth? 
analyze up to the border. You can go to the border, don't cross the border. The moment you cross the border with conventionality, you enter into ultimate, ultimate domain. In the ultimate domain, the conventional truth cannot sustain that analysis. Say, where's the table? The table is in front of you. This is conventional analysis, ultimate analysis. Conventional analysis. And see the table, which is the table? The top leg is the table, the legs are the table. This analysis is conventional truth and conventional analysis, ultimate analysis. Ultimate analysis. Because in this analysis, you will never find the table. The, the table will disappear. Right? So don't cross. When you examine the conventional truth, everyday world, things which exist in the everyday world, don't subject them to ultimate analysis. The moment you subject them to ultimate analysis, what will happen? They will disappear. Right? They will make no sense. In other words, it says that conventional truth cannot sustain the ultimate analysis. Right? So whereas, if the conventional truth does, does exist objectively, does exist objectively, as, as stated by the Swatandra Mathematics, if the conventional truth does exist objectively, as stated by the Swatandra Mathematics, then they, the conventional truth should exist ultimately. If they should exist ultimately, then they should be seen by the ultimate analysis. So they should be able to sustain the ultimate analysis. You're getting it? Okay. So, um, and yet, in reality, the conventional truth cannot sustain the ultimate analysis. Conventional truth cannot cannot be seen by cannot be seen by ultimate analysis. Right? Okay. Sorry, Kishula. In other words, can I say? Can can someone say ultimate analysis is to find objective existence? Uh, no. Ultimate analysis is to is to see if things exist objectively or or empty of objectively. Ultimate analysis is to analyze whether things exist objectively or not. This is the ultimate analysis, right? So the wisdom of emptiness of the flower is the ultimate analysis because it looks for the flower to exist objectively or not, and then it found that it 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 is it is empty of objective existence. This is what it. So in other words, in this stanza, it is um, Ajaya Chandrakiti is saying that you you shouldn't make subjective analysis if you not like subjective to, you, if you would like to ultimate analysis to or conventional truth uh, conventional analysis or ultimate analysis there's no subjective analysis conventional analysis yes. or ultimate analysis okay so which question no uh, my question is is subjective analysis no, I thought it's conventional, analysis. conventional analysis it is looking for existence in a subjective or empty or subjective. Ultimate analysis, it will be the searching no, no, for the existence. No, no. So don't try to define in your own ways. Always, always when you study, particularly when you study deeper philosophy, the words used, words used don't try to define in your own ways. The moment you define in your own ways, you will end up nowhere. So therefore, the words, particularly, for example, when Ashwa Chandra is saying something, listen to what he is saying, right? And try to, you don't have to believe in what he is saying. Okay, when he says ultimate analysis, you don't define it in your own ways, right? Say, for example, uh, say, okay, can you think of any same label, same word, understood in two different meanings? In two different languages. Can you think of any word? Camera. Huh? Camera. Camera. Mm -hmm. camera. In English is camera and yes. we take picture. In Italian it will be a room. Okay, good. Okay. Say okay, um, say you are you are Italian and I'm 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 a Britisher, right? Okay. Uh, Okay, um, Dogala, please make sure that you bring my camera. Huh? What? How can we bring the camera? Camera cannot be moved, <laughs> right? From your point of view, camera.
camera can never boot. You are just a stupid guy. You are saying that camera, camera, you think that camera can be moved, right? Which means you have not understood. You have not understood the, the power of the language, how the language works. But the moment I say, bring the camera, don't define camera according to how you understand it. Because the word is used by me. You have to first know, you have to first listen to what camera means according to me, the person who used that word. Right? Oh, camera. It doesn't mean room. It means that, you know, the, the machine to take photos. Okay, this is what is meant. Right? Then from your point of view, from your point of view, camera means a house with, you know, and then people who have a very intrinsic, believe in intrinsic, the, the, the intrinsic values of the references of the labels. Right? who believe that the reference of the label should be so intrinsic. So the moment you see, I say that, please bring the camera, everybody will start laughing. When they laugh, which means that they have a very strong belief that the reference of the label should be intrinsic. Right? So whereas, if you come to know that even the labels, the, the reference of the labels, they are not intrinsic. They are all relative. They are all dependent on many other factors, then you will not laugh. Those who laugh, no doubt you can say that this person has a very strong the, the perception of objective existence. Very easy. Right? Okay, so therefore, what I'm saying is that in the conversation, particularly in the context of philosophy, the moment you define the words according to your own ways, in your own ways, you will never come to a good conclusion. You will never come to a good conclusion in the dialogue. Dialogue will never happen. Because I was saying, camera, why do why can't you bring the camera? Right? Because the camera is so enormous, it is embedded on the ground. No, the camera is very small. No, it's not it's not small, it's so huge. Right? I paid seven this uh, I I cannot even buy that. I have to rent it. Rent it for five thousand sing dollars for per month. <laughs> right? No, 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 you, you can buy it. You can buy it from the shop. I can't buy it from the shop. <laughs> you just keep debating like this. <laughs> right? Keep debating like this because both sides are not willing to listen to the definition of the word camera according to that side. You believe that camera means that instrument. You believe that camera means a house. Right? So this is where the dialogue never, the dialogue is never productive when you don't, when you are not ready to listen to the definition of the word according to the other side. Okay, so particularly in the context of philosophy, say, ultimate analysis, the conventional analysis, what do they mean? What do they mean? So try to define it according to how these two words are used by the author of the text. Because we are studying a text, we are studying a text, a particular text. So from that point of view, the conventional analysis, conventional analysis, to paraphrase, conventional analysis is where, say, if you say, where's the table? It's right in front of you. Where's the table? This is conventional analysis. And then the answer, conventional answer is that it's right in front of you. This is good enough. Now, the moment you try to explore deeper than that, you're breaking the conventionality. You're crossing the border of conventionality. So any analysis up to that point, where's the table? Oh, it's in the TBC, TBC hall. Where is it? Then you run into TBC hall. It's right there. Up to this point is fine. Up to this point is conventional analysis. The moment, where's the table then? I went to the TBC hall and I went into this room and I, I, I'm just sitting on the, the, the seat and then, and then I'm seeing the top line, I'm seeing the legs. So who is at the table? The top level of the legs. The moment you analyze this, you have crossed the conventionality, right? So if you don't, if you don't understand, if you still don't understand it, you go to a shop and ask for ask for, for a biscuit, and the shopkeeper, the poor innocent tipper, the but shopkeeper will give you a biscuit. Which is the biggest? First item is a biscuit. Second item is a biscuit. The cover is a biscuit. The cover is a biscuit. First item is a biscuit. Then he will be confused. <laughs> the poor guy will be confused. Right? He's confused? 
And if he is gifted with little intelligence, he will see that, wow, this is something which happened never. <laughs> yes, the, the top cover is also not biscuit. And then the first atom is also not biscuit. Oh, that means the biscuit is not there. <laughs> yeah. And whereas if he's not, if he's very busy, <laughs> if he's very busy with many customers, he will say, please go to the mental hospital. Please go to the mental hospital. This is not the place. Right, he will send him to the mental hospital. So where <laughs> this the poor innocent shopkeeper have become desperate to send to the mental hospital, that becomes the ultimate analysis. <laughs> Up to the point where he could he could you know nicely deal with you, this is conventional analysis. Right? Okay. So at 35, when these entities of everyday experience are analyzed over and outside the everyday reality, what does it mean by this? Analyzed over and outside the everyday reality, what is the meaning of this? Ultimate analysis. You analyze beyond the conventional, the, the reality or conventional analysis. Beyond that, the the border of the conventionality. This is the meaning of the ultimate analysis, and this is the meaning of the, the analyzed over and um, over over and outside the everyday reality. Then they are not. They are found to have no other locus. Meaning, they cannot be found. They disappear. Therefore. Do not critically analyze the conventional truth, which means, therefore, do not subject the conventional truth to ultimate analysis. Right? Okay. Um, now, number three. What is number three? By by pointing, the rejecting the rejecting the rejecting the object of production by pointing to the by pointing to the, the absurdity that the true production cannot be. Rejected. Okay, so now you are what? You are Chandigarh's followers, right? Right? Yes. You are Prasangika, and I'm Swatana Madhumika. So we both, we both fall under Madhumika philosophy. The Madhumika philosophy. Yes. 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 Y
there is no true production of the flower, but there, but the, 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 the but there is intrinsic production of the flower, but there is objective production of the flower. This is how Swatantra Madhav Guru say yes, no, yes. very good. Okay, now, now from your point of view, from your point of view, intrinsic production, the objective production and true production mean the same, mean the same, from your point of view. From personal point of view, true production and objective production mean the same. From my point of view, these two do not mean the same. From your point of view, these two mean the same, right? Okay. Now, from your point of view, from your point of view, do I reject? Do I re do do the Swatantra Madhimikas reject um, objective production? No. So, which means Swatantra Madhimikas they accept. Objective production. Correct. Yes, no. Yes. Yes. So because they accept objective production, they should also accept true production. Yes, no. From your point of view. Yes. If I accept true production, I cannot reject true production. Yes, no. Yes. You getting it? Yes. So therefore, although I superficially I say the Swatani Manimika say that oh there is no true production, but deep inside I'm still accepting true production. If I accept true production, I cannot reject true production. Right? So this is the absurdity pointed to the Swatan Manimikas. The next question is, but this is your point of view, it's not the Swatan Manimikas point of view. Right? So Swatan Manimikas would still say the same thing. Right? Okay. So for this, what we have to do, what we have to do is that the ultimate reality, ultimate reality is, say, Emptiness of true existence while not rejecting intrinsic existence. We learned this somewhere? Yes. Huh? Four years ago? Huh? Fourth level of emptiness. Fourth level of something like that, right? Four, five, fifth, five levels of emptiness? We, we learned it. Oh, I think last life we met. <laughs> I think so, right? Last life or last, four years ago we met. We, we did it four years ago, or oh, four days ago, <laughs> three days ago. <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday we learned. Oh, I said, okay. <laughs> yesterday we oh, What are the five that was emptiness? I thought we did it four years ago. <laughs> emptiness of permanent unitary independent self. Emptiness of autonomous substantial self. Emptiness of external reality. Emptiness of true existence while not rejecting intrinsic existence and the emptiness of intrinsic existence, the fine. Okay? Okay, the fine. This you have to keep in mind. Only if you understand the fifth one, only if you understand the fifth one, only if you understand the fifth one, then you will realize that objective existence and true existence mean the same. Sorry, Krishna. So how does um, Swapantika define true existence? Oh, this is a good question. Okay, this is a good question. How, what does it mean by true existence in the context of the Swatantra Madhimika, right? Okay, this good question. And uh, while they reject, while they say, on the one hand Swatantra Madhimika, on the other hand Prasangika, right? Both equally reject true existence, right? Both equally exist, okay. This may be a little technical, and yet it's so precious. So I like to, I like all of us, to take part in this, right? It may be a little technical, don't worry. Because main said this many years ago, right? And this is very important. So those of you who are beginners, don't feel demoralized, or oh, it's too technical, don't worry. It's so, it's so precious. Okay, let me feel like this. Say, uh, you are the Prasanga Madhimika, and I'm Swatana Madhimika. And Prasanga Madhimika, says that true existence and objective existence mean the same. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Swatani Madhimikas, for them, true existence and objective existence, there's difference. Yes, no? Yes. Good. Okay, there's difference. Swatani Madhimikas would say there's difference between the two. True existence can be rejected, Objective existence cannot be rejected. You agree? Yes. Good. But for Prasangika Madhimik, 
true existence and objective existence remain the same. Both have to be rejected. Yes? Yes. Good. Okay. Now, if this were the case, then So what you? Now, according to you, who are you? Person you prosperous. According to you, Swatandu Madamik Swatandu Madamik Swatandu Madamik Swatandu Madamik believe in objective existence. Yes, no? Yes. Believe that this flower exists objectively. Yes, no? Yes. Good. Right? And yet, I say that the flower does not exist truly. truly. So true existence of the flower is rejected. Yes. Right? Whether I can reject or not reject, this is a different issue. But but outwardly, I would say that true existence of the flower is not there. It doesn't exist. Okay. Now, with the flower, I move to the self, the person. Right? I. If you ask me, if somebody asks me, this person, does this person exist truly? What is my answer? No. What is the Swatan Madhima's answer? No. Does this person exist objectively? Yes. What is the Swatan Madhima's answer? Yes. Yes, it does exist objectively. It does not exist truly. Right? Okay. Now, now let us see. Let us see. Say, um, this person, this person, okay. Where is this person? Everyone in Delhi, they were looking for this person. Right? They went to Tibet house. They couldn't find him. Right? And then they inquired the secretary, where did this person go? Oh, he went to Singapore. And somebody comes to Singapore. Right? And then, where is he? Oh, he's in TBC. They come to TBC. Then, he sees me. Right? He sees me. Okay. Uh, where is Dorji? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Right? Okay. So this, up to this point, the analysis is what? Conventional analysis. No? Where are you? Your body is you? Or your mind is you? This is conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? <laughs> you would say this is ultimate analysis. Swatantil Madhimikas would say this is conventional analysis. You, you who? Prasantikas would say that the moment I go into the aggregates, my body and my, my mind. The moment somebody analyzes to look for the person within the aggregates, the body or the mind, from your point of view, this is ultimate analysis. It's not conventional analysis. Whereas for Swatana and Madhimika, this is still conventional analysis. Because within the conventional analysis, the conventional truth should be findable. Right? Within the conventional analysis, hey, where's the flower? It's here. It's a conventional analysis, ultimate analysis. Conventional. Within the conventional domain, you should be able to find the conventional truth. Like the conventional. Did, you, did I find this flower or not? Yes. In the we found it. But then, if you look at this person, where are you? I'm here. Which? Your body or your mind? This conventional analysis or ultimate analysis, from your point of view? Why ultimate analysis? Because in this analysis, the object of the analysis will disappear from your point of view, from personal point of view. Yes, no? Yes. Good. Now, from the Swatani Mani point of view, this is still conventional analysis. It is not ultimate analysis. How? In this analysis, the person can still be found. The body of the mind. My mind is the, the me. Right? So, they would say that the mind, my mental consciousness, my mind is me. Is the is the the final me, right? So now, now crossing beyond that, crossing beyond that, then we see that the person disappears. So then when you analyze beyond that, then the person disappears. Up to this point is fine, according to Swatantra Madhimi. You're getting it? Okay, this is very important. So this is a fine line between Swatantra Madhimi and the Prasangi Madhimi, because many of the philosophers. They think that the view of the Prasangi Madhimik and the Swatan Madhimik, it is the same. Many people say that. And some people say that, they think that, oh, the distinction is very fine. So if you really go here, um, we can't really easily say what's the distinction. 
And some people, they think that Swatantra Manikum's view is easier to be digested. But the beauty of the Prasangha Madhimik is that the moment you cross the border of conventionality, <coughs> nothing can be found, right? And what is the conventionality? Conventionality means conventionality as accepted by the conventional world, right? Okay, so uh, say the, so what I'm saying here is that, say, according to the Swatantra Madhimik, where are you? Where is the origin? Where is the origin? Oh, I'm here. This convention analysis or alternate analysis. Convention. And you see the person and still say, where are you? Your body and your mind. Convention analysis, ultimate analysis. According to Swatantra Madhimik. It is still convention analysis. Why? Because they believe that with this analysis, the person can still be found. And what is found? The mind is found. According to? According to Swatantra Madhimik. Right? Okay. So this, okay. Um, Can you ask about this? Because when the mind gets to be found, that is in line with mind only school. And how does the mind only school separate from Sautantrika in the sense that mind, mind is the one that you found and it is the conventional truth? Okay. So do you all follow the question? The question is that if Swatana Bedu says that the mind is found to be the person. So this philosophy seems to be more in line with Chittamata philosophy. Because Chittamata would say that, finally, who are you? My mind. What really exists there? It's just a mind. Nothing is there outside the mind. This is Chittamata philosophy. So, so this seems to be more in line with Chittamata philosophy. Is this the case, this question? OK, anyone who can help me? That this is still not Chittamata philosophy? Anyone? OK, let me see. How did you able, how did you how did you how did you converse with the people in Singapore? I would say I use a language to converse with the people. Right? I see. Right? But the Singaporean people they, they speak Mandarin, right? So you must be knowing Mandarin. The language is not just Mandarin, there's English also. Likewise when you say, my mind is the cell. Which mind? This question I have not asked yet. When you say which mind, then Chitamatra and Swatantra Madhavi diverge. Up to this point, the two agree. Which mind? Alevijan. No, 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 no Alevijan. It's a mental consciousness, six mental consciousness. So then the, the, the two diverge. Otherwise, up to this point, they are same, right? Same, somebody who does not speak any English. How do you converse with Singaporeans? I converse with the language. Hey, how do you, Dorji, how do you converse with the, the Singaporeans? I converse with the language. So both of us agree? Yes, no? Yes. And then I say, what language do you use? English. And then you turn to the other person. Oh, you also speak English, no? Then how do you converse with that people? You converse with the language, and he converse with language, and he uses English. It's not only English language, it's also Mandarin. So then language, how to language is fine, but with what language then? They differ. Chidamatra and Swatan Madhavi, they differ when you go into what mind? Excuse me, Keshe, but I think if you directly to say the mind is the person, yeah. then all school owners agree the mind, the person is no necessary formation, no consciousness. But they don't worry. Okay. So, so each of us needs a cause of zero, the third. So, I think you can see your mind. The Kansar Holland Chevina, Kansar Madhikarislava. Okay, so Gijila has to learn this, uh, the, what is that? On the, um, Ajay Pavivekas one quote. Ajay Pavivekas quote. So Gijila has to make the distinction between the substantial self, nominal self, there's distinctions there. So, what is a self? What is a self? This mind is a self. This is what the Swatana Mandarin says. Then, Within, within this self, within the self, this mind, in what way this is self? That the, the substantial self, this will come later, right? Otherwise, this question, what's the self? This mind is the self. This is what is exactly said by Acharya Pavveka in his text, Tarka Juala, the blazing of reasoning. Acharya Pavveka, he is the, uh, the Swatantra Madhavi philosopher. 
and also the trailblazer, the progenitor of the Swati Marami. So what he says is that in Tibetan, coach and the number seven, the Dawi Ta Unsu Ta De, number seven, the answer was the mission Ta You Know. It means that I would, I would coach a we, coach a number seven, we would designate this consciousness or the mind as a self. We would explicitly designate. We would explicitly designate this consciousness of the mind as a self, because the self takes the reincarnation. Because the self takes the reincarnation. Number two, the answer will be which die know. Because the self takes the reincarnation, it is the self. So this is what is said by the trailblazer of the Swatantrik Madhumik. Okay. So um, the the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, same the and in fact. That the mind is a cell. This is a very strong debate put by this Swatan Madhumi against the Prasangika. And you are following what? Prasangika <laughs> Madhumi, right? So the Swatan Acharya Bhavava, he put a very strong debate against the, the Prasangika Madhumi with this question. So, how he put the debate was that if the mind is not a cell, if your consciousness, if your mind is not a self, then when you die, what you have is your body and the mind. What you have is your body and the mind. When you die, you leave your body behind. Your brain, your body behind. So what transmigrates is the mind travels. Right? And you also say that I travel. You also say that I travel, and what actually travels is the mind. So if mind is not the if the mind is not self, then where's the self which travels? So therefore, the mind is the self. So therefore, we explicitly designate the mind to be the self. Because the mind travels, therefore the mind should be the self. This is, is the, the debate from Ajahn Pampeka. So, what answers would the, the students of Ajahn Chandrakirti give to this debate? Ajahn Chandrakirti would not accept that the consciousness or the mind is the self. Right? This is the self. Okay. Say what Gishila say is that when you say my mind is a self, then Acharya Chandrakirti may ask you, your mind is it male or female? <laughs> Are you male or female? Some of you will say I'm female, I'm male, and your mind is male or female? It is no gender, right? It is no gender. Gender is possible on the basis of the body. A mind does not have a gender, so you have you have a gender. You as as a person has a gender. And the mind doesn't have a gender, right? So how can the mind be the person? So this Acharya, this is would be uh, Acharya Chandra, my speculation of Acharya Chandra is debate against Acharya Bhavaveka. Then Acharya Bhavaveka, he became desperate. He has to look for answer. So then he would distinguish between the putative self and the substantial self. So the self, the mind is the substantial self. Substantial self may not have the gender. The putative self has the gender. I, I, without going into the depth, without going into saying, I'm lifting this, I'm lifting this mark, I'm lifting this flower, I'm lifting this flower. It is my hand which is lifting it, my mind is not lifting it up. Right? My hand is lifting up this flower. So and yet you say that I'm lifting this flower. So there's which there's one I which pervades to the body which pervades to the mind both. So that I, or the self, is known as the putative self, designated self. This English word, putative, imputed, putative, P-U-T-A-T-I-V-E, putative self. And whereas, when you go into detail, when you go into detail, say, um, who planned all these wonderful administration of Singapore, that everybody has a job, that everybody has a house, that there is even that, that the water is mixed, that that the that the, the whole citizen, every citizen of Singapore get uh, clean drinking water, this water is a war, right? Such amazing planning. Who planned it? Oh Singapore government planned it. Right? Over government. When you go deep into then we see that is Lin Kuan Yu. Right? The president, president prime minister. Prime Minister, Prime Minister Lin Kuan Yew, he planned it, right? 
Amazing. Then he, he did he go to the reservoir to dig the, <laughs> the and then put the bricks there? He did not. Right? So so who did it? The people did it. That is the overall, overall putative government. Putative Singapore government. When you go to the, the one who's the final brain behind all these things, you're looking for the substantial. So the self, according to Swatant and Madhavik, is of two kinds. One is the substantial self, and the other one is the putative self. So the putative self is what the ordinary people converse with. Oh, I did this, I did this. They will not talk about the mind. You go to the mind, point to the mind as the self. The ordinary people will not go for that. Ordinary people still simply be hovering around the putative self. Then, philosophically, philosophically we see that if it's purely, if it's purely, purely, say, on the labels, if it's purely labeled, nothing from the object, there's a problem. This is what the Swatan Malimik would say. Okay, so that would be, uh, that may come as a part of the question answer, uh, during the questions and session, right? So for the time being, what we say is that, say for, for Prasangi Malimik, the moment you say, where are you? I'm here. This is the border of the conventional analysis. You're getting it? The moment you cross beyond that, you go into ultimate analysis. Whereas for Swatantri Balimek, where are you? I'm here. Right? Is that the final border? No, you can still go beyond. Your body or your mind. Right? Is that question, is that question still within the conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? It's still within conventional analysis. Why conventional analysis? Within this analysis, still you can find a person. What is this person? My consciousness. So who said it? How do we know that Swatman Malimik said it? It is said very clearly by Acharya Bhavaviveka in his text known as Blazing of the Reasoning. Actually, and the, the, the title of the text, what is the title of the text? Blazing of the Reasoning. Right? Blazing of the Reasoning. Tarka Jwala. Okay. So, um, this is Swatan Manimi's view. Okay, now with this mind... So, in the nutshell, what is truly, truly yeah. and the objective? Okay, now, say, anything which, which exists beyond this analysis, beyond this analysis, seeing the mind as a self, then you analyze beyond that, then it becomes truly existent. So that does not exist according to Swatan Manimi. For Prasangika, what does it mean by true existence with self? Where are you? I'm here. Away, your body or your mind. The moment you cross this analysis, you find a self, you're finding a truly existent self, according to the Sangik Madhimik. Okay, I'll repeat it. Say, first let me say the, because you are more keen on Prasangik, I know that. <laughs> right? You're so addicted to a Prasangik, so I'll start with Prasangik. Okay, according to Prasangika, say, where are you? Right? Where is Dorji? And she probably said, oh, he's the NTPC, right? Okay. Then you come here. Hey, where is Dorji? Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Is this conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? <laughs> conventional analysis. Conventional analysis. So, what can be found by conventional analysis? Right, okay, let's say conventional analysis. No? After seeing me, which is, which is you? Which is Dorji? Your body or your mind? This analysis is what? Okay, ultimate analysis. So, to this analysis, if you say that, okay, if you say, what is Dorji? My mind is the Dorji, right? You're looking for something more than the mere conventionality. Something more than the mere conventionality is known as true existence, according to Prasangika. Something more than the mere conventionality is true existence, is objective existence, according to Swat Prasangu Madhimik. The moment you cross that, and still if you find something, if you find something as Dorji, right? If you find something as Dorji, and according to Prasangu, what do you find? You find the emptiness of Dorji. You don't find Dorji, right? You find the emptiness of Dorji. You don't find Dorji. Whereas according to Swatani Manmin, still you find Dorji. At that, with this question, you don't find the emptiness of Dorji, you find Dorji. So that is anything, 
anything you find as the illustration, illustration of what you are looking for, the person or whatever you are looking for, crossing beyond the mere conventionality is known as true existence of the object. From the second point of view, true existence, objective existence, ultimate, and ultimate existence, what else? Intrinsic existence, inherent existence, independent existence, they all mean the same. They all mean the same. According to Prasangi Madhimek. You get it? Okay. Now, according to Swatang Madhimek, according to Swatang Madhimek, right? Okay. Uh, where is the table? Hey, where is the table? I'm looking for a table, right? Then you say, oh, it's somewhere in the TPC, one of the rooms. Which room? Oh, maybe the teaching hall. Where? It's in front of you. Right? Okay, up to this point is conventional analysis or ultimate analysis. <coughs> now we are doing from the point of view of the Swatandi Marine. Conventional analysis, ultimate analysis. Conventional analysis. Well, which is the table? The shape, of the shape of the table is the table? Shape of the table is the table? Or the collection of the, of the or the table, top half of the table is the table? Or the legs of the table is the table? Right? Or the, the atoms which constitute the table are the table? Or the collection of the atoms is the table? With this analysis, very good with this analysis, is it still conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? Conventional. conventional. Because you see the shape of the table to the table, according to Swanthaji Madhime. The shape of the table is the table. Only the shape. Yeah. So, okay, the top line is not the table, the legs are not the table, the atoms are not the table, but the shape of the table is the table. This is what the Swatan Mani would say. But Prasangiga, Prasangiga, the mere convention, the mere convention, mere convention meaning, what's the table? Is what you're seeing in front of you, that's it. Right? Don't ask me which, which in front of you, the top leg or the legs, or the shape. Don't ask me this question. The moment you go into this level, you go into ultimate analysis. Whereas for Swatanda Marime, you go into this level, you're permissible. There's still a conventional analysis. What do you find? The shape of the table as the table. Right? Now, which shape? The shape of the leg or the shape of the top leg, and then the table disappears. So, the moment you cross that level, then, according to Swatanda Marime, you're looking for true existence of the table. Right? Okay, for the beginners, it may be a little technical, but still it is very precious. Eventually, if you want to go gade gade, <laughs> para gade, para sangate, body soha, right? Simply by uh, uh, right, some lamas coming to you, guru is coming to you, bless you with putting torma, torma, ritual cake on your head, then the next day you become enlightened. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible, right? Impossible. Yet these empowerments, if the teacher, if the teacher is very standard, the empowerments, the empowerments have power. Have power is cannot be rejected. It's so powerful. At the same time, the power of the to what extent is the power of the empowerment? It's not just the teacher, it's the students also depend on so many factors, right? But the power of the empowerment will make sense only if this takes this text makes sense to you. Right? So therefore there's no escape, there's no shortcut. And people say, oh Girupa thing, what is that? The philosophy. You don't have to study that. You don't have to study that. Oh Arandagarjuna, what is Arandagarjuna? Right? And some people say that I've not even know, I've not even studied these things. These things, the all these volumes. I've not even studied these things. Meant to dissuade others. It's a clear indication that a person is really ignorant of all these texts. Brilliant, very precious teachings. Right? Not only he or she, not only he or she is blinded of the beautiful, brilliant gems of these teachings, you are dissuading others from visiting these gems of the teachings. And yet, if you find it technical, don't underestimate your potential. We all have the same potential. What we have, what we have learned from Dharma Dadustama, the true nature that you have, the true nature of your mind that you have, and the Buddha's mind, the omniscient mind, there's no difference, it's the same. 
only thing is keep removing it, the metal turns, and the true nature will keep coming out. This is this is what we have to see. On that basis, never underestimate your potential. Only if you have studied this text for 10 years, 20 years, then if you still don't understand what I'm saying, this, then come to complain to me. <laughs> right? We are studying this for just two days. If you complain, don't complain to me. Go to the monastery universities, talk to the young boys, the young monks there. Then they will ask you, how many years you have studied this? 20 years? 10 years? And you say, two years, two days. <laughs> two days, they will laugh at you. Don't say this. If you do visit the monastic university, don't ever say that I studied this text for two days. <laughs> right? Just simply be decent. Remain, uh, assume a dignified silence. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Assume a dignified silence. If somebody says, oh, you're from TBC, yes, 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 yes. What have you learned? We have learned something. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't say that you have, you have studied this. The moment you study you things, you said that you studied this into Andrew Middleway, they will immediately surrender. Well, they will look at you with, with respect. The next question will come. <laughs> yeah. They immediately they will surrender. The young monks, the logicians, the philosophers, they will surrender. Then, uh, then, uh, then they'll ask the second question to you with great respect. What's the second question? How many years you have studied? <laughs> then, you, then your answer is four days. <laughs> okay, we will stop here for um, uh, 15 minutes. We'll come back at um, 5 to 5. <laughs>